TUC Radio, San Francisco. Time of Useful Consciousness. Bringing Down Civilization. A Talk by Derek Jensen. A Talk by Derek Jensen is an improvisational, nonlinear event attended by personal friends, loyal fans, and loyal critics. The setting is non hierarchical, with a lot of give and take. This young writer, with almost ten books to his credit, earned such attention for his intellectual courage, his very memorable jokes, and his unflinching support of the living earth, of salmon, forests, and rivers. Derek Jensen wrote in his early book, Listening to the Land, We are members of the most destructive culture ever to exist. Our assault on the natural world on indigenous and other cultures, on women, on children, on all of us, through the possibility of nuclear suicide, all these are unprecedented in their magnitude and ferocity. And he follows that with a question, why do we act as we do? What are sane and effective responses to outrageously destructive behavior. What will it take for us to stop the horrors that characterize our way of being? My work and life revolve around these questions. When I recorded Derek Jensen in the Oakland, California warehouse of AK Press, he asked that question in a much more pointed way. If civilization is destroying us and the earth... Do we need to bring down civilization? Here is Derek Jensen. I was down in uh, Asheville, North Carolina, and uh, uh, doing Q and A. And this guy asked, um, "How many environmentalists does it take to change a light bulb?" And I said, "I'll, I'll, I'll bite. How many?" And he said, "Well, actually, it was an honest question. I don't know." It's like. <laughs> That's not how the joke's supposed to work. Um, <laughs> and, and that's one of the neat things about being a writer is, is, you know, people will ask me all sorts of questions, and a lot of times they think I'm, like, really smart because they ask a question and I answer. But the thing is, that's because, you know, somebody asked me that question three months ago, and I said, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. And then, you know, four weeks later, I come up with an answer, and then next time it's like, oh, yeah, I'm so bright. And so anyway, that night, and this probably says more about my social life than I wanted to, that, late that night I was sort of ruminating on how many environmentalists does it take to change a light bulb um, when I got the answer, which is ten. One, to write the light bulb or letter requesting a change. Four, to circulate online petitions. One, to file a lawsuit. One, to send the light bulb loving kindness, knowing that this is the only way real change occurs. <laughs> One, to accept the light bulb precisely the way it is, clear in the knowledge that to not accept another is to do great harm to oneself. One, to write a book about how and why the light bulb must change. And finally, one, to smash the light bulb, because we all know it's never going to change. <laughs> So as a longtime grassroots environmental activist and as a creature living in the thrashing endgame of civilization, I am intimately acquainted with the landscape of loss and have grown accustomed to carrying the daily weight of despair. I've walked clear cuts that wrap around mountains and drop into valleys and climb ridges to fragment watershed after watershed, and I've sat silent near empty streams that two generations ago were lashed into whiteness by uncountable salmon coming home to spawn and die. A few years ago, I began to feel pretty apocalyptic, but I hesitated to use that word, in part because of those cartoons I've seen of crazy penitents carrying the end as near signs, and in part because of the power of the word itself, apocalypse. I didn't want to use it lightly. And then a friend and fellow activist said to me, so Derek, what will it take for you to finally use that word? Will it take the death of salmon, death of runs of salmon so thick that people were afraid to put their boats in water for fear they'd capsize, so thick that they would keep people awake at night with the slapping of their tails against the water, so thick that horses were afraid to get in the water? I was up on Mill Creek near where I live, up in, by Crescent City yesterday. Isn't it amazing how many, how many creeks are called Mill Creek? That's pretty awful. Um, anyway, I was up on Mill Creek, I saw two salmon swim by, two beautiful, wonderful salmon. 
and it, it, it made me cry, in, in part because they were so beautiful and in part because it was two salmon. And anyway, this person gave me a picture of uh, this river in southern Alaska. And if you look at it at first, it looks like there's just the, a, dark, uh, a dark bottom on the river. You know, the, the edge of the river is, is sort of yellow, sandy, and then it gets, the, it gets dark in the middle. But then if you look more closely, you see that the reason that it's dark is because it's filled with fish. It is, it is literally filled with fish. I mean, you, you couldn't step into the river without stepping on fish. And I showed the picture to my mom, and um, she said, yeah, that'll last about another 10 or 15 years. Civilization needs to come down now. Um, like, groovy, Mom. Um, anyway, so this, this friend was saying, so will it take the death of the runs of salmon? Maybe it'll take the death of flocks of passenger pigeons so large they darken the sky for days at a time. The death of flocks of Eskimo curlews just as large. Maybe it'll take the turning of the sea off San Diego into a dead zone. Maybe it'll take global warming. Uh, I'm sure you know that um, this, just, this just out. Uh, krill populations have collapsed by 70% in the last 20 years in Antarctica. And when you, when you mess with the krill, it's all over. I mean, it is over. Um, 90% of the large fish in the oceans are gone, 90%. The response by the head, and, head of the National Marine Fisheries Services to that was, and this is a direct quote, we have to ask ourselves what level of decline is reasonable or sustainable. Um, so, you know, my friend kept asking, you know, what will it finally take for you to finally use that word, Derek? Give me a specific threshold at which you'll pi finally use the word apocalypse. Thanks, George. Just yesterday, I was talking to somebody about the krill. And we got into an argument, actually, because I said, you know, this culture is killing the planet. And he said, I think kill is kind of a strong word. Um, I said, what do you call, uh, you know, 90% of the large fish being gone? And he said, I think it's changing. It's changing the planet. And I said, 90%. He said, OK, changing a lot. <laughs> and I said, OK, what would you say if somebody cut off your arm? And then they cut off your other arm. And they cut off your leg. I mean, are you being killed, or are you just being changed? Um, and the conversation sort of went downhill from there. Um, <laughs> I've, I've heard it said that one of the first rules of propaganda is that if you can slide your premises by people, you've got them. And so, for example, you hear a talking head on television say, how can we make the U.S. economy grow? It's like, oh, God, I don't, I don't know. Let's think about that. But there's some premises there. First off, we want the U.S. economy to grow. Second, we want the U.S. economy to exist. Third, who the hell's we? And it's kind of like with... Uh, it was said of Hitler, from insane premise to monstrous conclusion, Hitler was coldly, icily logical. If he could get you to buy into the premise that there is a Jewish problem, well, it's like, okay, how are we going to solve it? And then he can move from there. And it's best if he doesn't even say it, but if he just slides it by you and you move from there. And this is inherent um, everywhere. I mean, it's inherent, very, very deeply inherent in our language. Um, I'll give two examples of that really quickly. One of them is that uh, the other day, a friend was talking to me and, and said, so how much longer do you think we're going to be in Iraq? And I said, <laughs> we're in Iraq? <laughs> I, I thought we were in Northern California. And... This friend knows me, so she just shook her head, and then she said, no, how much longer do you think our troops are going to be in Iraq? I said, I got troops? Is it okay? Can I, like, send them up to the Columbia and have them take out the Grand Coulee? I mean, what? Will they listen to me? And she said, okay, well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to call you tomorrow, okay? And the, the point is that if they can get us to say we, then we're fighting ourselves as well as them. 
And we'll get there in a minute, but if I could get one thing across in my work, it would be that the government is a government of occupation and the culture is a culture of occupation. And, of course, all of my American Indian friends will say, what took, what took you so long to figure that one out? <laughs> and, I mean, what does a government of occupation do? It moves in, it extracts resources, and doesn't care about communities. That's the definition. If Nazis or other fascists took over North America, <laughs> what would we all do? Well, yeah, we'd vote. Yeah. <laughs> What would we all do if they implemented Mussolini's definition of fascism? Fascism should more appropriately be called corporatism because it's a merger of state and corporate power. And what would we then do if they instituted laws allowing them to put a significant portion, say one-third, of all Jewish males between the ages of 18 and 35 into concentration camps? What if this occupied country called itself a democracy, but most everyone understood elections to be shams, with citizens allowed to choose between different wings of the same fascist, or following Mussolini corporate, party? What if anti-government activity was opposed by stormtroopers and secret police? Oh, I'm going to tell you my secret fantasy, which won't be secret after this, <laughs> which is that the next time they have one of those FTAA meetings or WTO or whatever, that all the cops will suddenly turn around and they'll start shooting at the WTO representatives. <laughs> Some people fantasize about Nicole Kidman. I fantasize about <laughs> shooting it. Anyway... It's not going to happen. It has happened. It did happen. It happened in the French Revolution. It happened in 1873 or 1877 or something like that when some uh, militia members in Pennsylvania turned their guns over to the strikers. Uh, Venezuela. Venezuela. Oh, that's true. That's true. It's too bad we have to go so far back in the U.S. Anyway, would you fight back? If there already existed a resistance movement, would you join it? Substitute the word African American for Jewish and ask yourself the same questions. Now, would you resist if the fascists irradiated the countryside, poisoned food supplies, made rivers unfit for swimming, and so filthy you wouldn't even dream of drinking from them anymore? Um, by the way, I can tell you exactly why. I don't see any here, but, but if I had a... a thing of bottled water, I would, I would hold it up and I would say, um, this is why we're not going to have a revolution, because if people will pay for water bottled in plastic, they will suffer any indignity. What if they did this because, hell, I can't finish that sentence because no matter how I try, I can't come up with a motivation good enough even for fascists to irradiate and toxify the landscape and water supplies. If fascists systematically deforested the planet, would you join an underground army of resistance, head to the forest, and from there to the boardrooms and to the halls of the Reichstag to pick off the occupying D forces, and most especially those who give them their marching orders? I mean, what would we do if a bunch of aliens came down from outer space and they started to systematically vacuum the oceans and they, they dammed every river? There, there are, in the United States, there are 70,000 dams larger than six feet tall and two million dams total, um, which means if we only took out one dam, one large dam every day, it would only take us 200 years to take them all out.